baptism is. Baptism is done for the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2.38. Baptism is done to save us, 1 Peter 3.21, Acts 2.40, Mark 16.16. 16. Baptism is done to wash away our sins, Acts 22.16. Baptism is done to be reborn to new life, John 3.5, Romans 6.3-6. 6, 3 6. Baptism is done to clothe ourselves with Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Trust in the Lord with all your hearts, and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. The Lord, Paul, remain standing this afternoon. I'd like for you to go with us to the book of Isaiah, chapter 30. Let me express my appreciation to all of the brethren who have preceded me. In this conference, I have been blessed by your ministry immensely. Amen. I have been enriched. I want to say to Brother Elder, thank you for obeying the Holy Ghost. Amen. I, this entire week, have uh, struggled with two or three different messages, trying to settle my mind and heart for this service. And this morning, when uh, I rose and began to prepare for the day, the uh, Lord took me in a complete different direction. And uh, Brother Elder preached part one, and with the help of the Lord, I'll preach part two. Praise God. Without a doubt, I felt that there was a confirmation in the Holy Ghost with what he preached. And um, I want to try to obey the Lord myself this afternoon. Don't you appreciate the diversities of ministries in the apostolic church? I didn't say diversities of messages. I said diversities of ministries. Thank God. Peter, James, and, and uh, Paul, or Peter, John, and Paul uh, are the three ministries that seem to stand head and shoulders taller than anyone else in the New Testament. And each of their ministries uh, seem to be a follow-up of either their occupation or what they were doing at the time that they were called, that was associated with their occupation. In Mark chapter 1, Peter was casting his net, and John was mending his net. Paul was a tent builder, and I think these three men represent, for the most part, the ministries of the apostolic church. And we have those that are in-gatherers, those men that can have a great impact for revival and winning souls. And then we have those who are like Paul. Uh, they build. They're master builders. And we have those who are like the Apostle John, who uh, was a man that was a restorer. He was a repairer. The, right, the letter that Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus was completely different than John wrote in the book of Revelation. Amen. And I thank God for all of the men that preach this wonderful message in the apostolic ranks. Amen. We have men that come in and can preach, and many people get the Holy Ghost. Then we have other men coming in, and they're establishing those that have been preached. Well, oh, praise the Lord. Amen. The, the sheet that Peter saw knit at four corners, Paul, and, and it represented the Gentile church, Paul took that same sheet and made a house out of it, and they gave them a place to live. And so I appreciate the, the ministries, and I thank you, brethren, for obeying the Holy Ghost. And if the Lord will help us this afternoon, then we'll do our best. I realize I'm the only thing standing between you and lunch, and so I'll do my best to make this as painless as possible. Hallelujah. Isaiah 30, and I have a rather lengthy reading. Please indulge me and bear with me. Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel but not of me, that cover with a covering but not of my spirit that they may add sin to sin, that walk to go down into Egypt, and have not asked at my mouth, to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh, and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore shall the strength of Pharaoh be your shame, and the trust in the shadow of Egypt your confusion. For his princes were at Zoan, and his ambassadors came to Hanes, and they were all ashamed of a people that could not profit them, nor be in help, nor profit, but a shame and also a reproach. The burden of the beast of the south into the land of trouble and anguish, from thence come the young and old lion, the viper, 
and the fiery flying serpent. They will carry their riches upon the shoulders of young asses and their treasures upon the bunches of camels to a people that shall not profit them. For the Egyptians shall help in vain and to no purpose. Therefore have I cried concerning this, their strength is to sit still. Now go, and pay particular attention to the next few verses. Now go, write it before them in a table, and note it in a book, that it may be for the time to come forever and ever, that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that, that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, see not, and to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things. Speak unto us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. Get you out of the way. Turn aside out of the path. Cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. Therefore thus saith the Holy One of Israel, because you despise this word and trust in oppression and of perverseness and stay their own. Thus, therefore, this iniquity shall be to you as a breach ready to fall, swelling out in a high wall, whose breaking cometh suddenly at an instant, and he shall break it as the breaking of the potter's vessel, and is broken in pieces. He shall not spare, so that there shall not be found in the bursting of it a sherd to take fire from the hearth, to take water with all out of the pit. Amen. If the Lord will help me this afternoon, I want to preach on this thought, the price of rejecting right things. Amen. The price of rejecting right things. Amen. If I would subtitle it, I guess it would be the result, and that is, not enough left to be of any use. Amen. Would you help us pray right now? Everybody together. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Let's ask the Lord to let our hearts be open and receptive. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We need to hear from you this afternoon, Lord. Our hearts are hungry. Our souls are thirsting. We want the right way. We want the old paths. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let the church shout amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Amen. The beginning of chapter number 30 lays somewhat of a foundation and a groundwork for that that the Lord began to speak in verse number 8, the condemnation and the indictment that he offered up concerning Israel. Not only that, but uh, the judgment that followed. And uh, some of the things that concerned the Lord and that caused him to respond in this manner was the fact that the people of the Lord had become a rebellious nation as we found them in that same case many other times in the word of the Lord and they had begun to look toward Egypt and toward Pharaoh to draw from those particular locales their strength and also their counsel. They started trusting in what Egypt would have to offer to them. And, of course, the Lord began to explain to them that the strength of Pharaoh would be their shame, and the trust in the shadow of Egypt, your confusion. I think it would go without saying this afternoon that uh, we are living in that kind of an environment today. It is sad that so many of those who are numbered among us 
trying to deliver me to the place. Come on now. As long as the deliverer is there, they like the deliverer. And they like him whatever he is presented as. Amen. The lesser. Oh, hallelujah. They like him when he's presented as the baptizer. Oh, hallelujah. They like him whenever you present him as as many things that he is. But don't present him as the only one. That that makes me uncomfortable. That gets me where I know that I'm in heaven. It gets me in the depths of my soul. Oh, hallelujah. You see, there's a lot of folks that look the baptizer who are really not going to baptism. And there's a lot of folks, oh, hallelujah, that like the deliverer, but they really don't want the deliverance. There's a lot of them that want the healer, but they really don't want the healing. Praise the Lord. The Holy One out of my face. Hallelujah. The Holy One prompts us. It makes us realize where we are. Oh, God, I'm so weak. I am so weak. And I am so unholy. I am so carnal at times. Jesus, I want to be different. I want to be better. Come on, saints. Come on, saints. Hallelujah. Here is a man in Isaiah chapter 6 that sees this holy one high and lifted up. And he hears the cries of the angel, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And something grips his heart. And he says, woe is me, for I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell among the people of unclean lips. I'm unclean. Oh, God, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I'm telling you, getting in the presence of Jesus Christ. When somebody starts preaching on him and his goodness and his greatness and his holiness, it ought to move us. It ought to challenge us. Hallelujah. Come on, I just feel like I need to tell you to preach some of them to this afternoon. Hallelujah. We'll tell you something. We don't have enough preaching about Jesus in the pulpit. Thank you, brethren, for preaching what you have preached in this meeting. My attention has been put back on the Lord over and over again. Oh, hallelujah. I saw the blood flowing one more time last night. Oh, praise the Lord. I saw Calvary. I saw Calvary in his holy uh, beauty. I saw what I need to be. And it's back one more time to the cross. And say, let the blood come to me one more time. Cleanse me, oh God. Oh, hallelujah. Can I tell you, brethren, I don't have time to get in the pulpit and call other men's names in this pulpit and warn you to not be like them. Because I want to tell you something. Preaching about another man.
I said he knew how to kill the lion. But if you read First Samuel chapter 17, I want you to note something. The Bible said, he told Saul these words. He said, ah, your servant was out for Jesus by the sheep. And he said, a lion that came in and took a lamb out of my father's flock. And he said, I went out. And he said, I smoked that lion and I took the lamb out of his mouth. Oh, hallelujah. Meaning that his chief purpose in doing what he was doing was to save the lamb. Praise the Lord. Amen. And then he said, and when he rose against me, he said that I rent him. Which means to me that if he could have saved the lamb out of the lion's mouth, and the lion had turned and went his way, he probably would have left the lion alone. Hallelujah. He would have just slapped at it. Oh, hallelujah. I want to tell you, there's just some things that all you need to do is slap at it and save the lamb. Unless what you have slapped at rises up, oh hallelujah, and threatens, oh hallelujah, the welfare and the position of the ministry and the shepherd. And that's when the shepherd determines uh, this is something a little bigger than we just want to slap at it's time to kill it. Well, well, well. Amen. He said, the bear did the same thing, and I did the same thing to the bear. I went out there, and I smote him, and I took the lamb out of his mouth. Amen. He was, all he was concerned about was saving the lamb. Saving the lamb. That's all I'm concerned about is saving the lamb. I have encountered some things in pastoring and working that I have felt that there was no more need to deal with it than to slap it one time and go on my way and just save a little lamb that was about to be consumed. By something. When I saw that spirit rise up in rebellion, oh hallelujah, and threaten the position that the pulpit was taken. Hallelujah. That's when I said, boy, I'll make a, I'll make a lion skin. Hey, man, out of you to hang on my wall. Oh, praise the Lord. And I'll take that bear skin rug and I'll make it something I can put on my floor and walk on for a while. Woo, hallelujah. Come on now. And so it was no problem for him when he got out to the battlefield and there was Goliath uh, standing on the battlefield uh, and crying out and reviling the people of God and even the God that Israel served. Uh, something rose inside of him and said, hey, but one way to handle this fella and that's kill him. Hallelujah. I'm going to take his life. And on the battlefield he went, but it wasn't enough. Oh, hallelujah. He knocked the giant down. Read the scripture. He knocked him down, but he knew it wasn't enough to knock him down. He ran to where he was, stood on that fellow's chest and pulled his sword out and cut his head off and said, I'm not just going to knock him out. I'm going to make sure this thing's dead. Well, hallelujah. Come on, I'm not done yet. Amen. I'm just not going to knock him out. I'm going to kill him. There are some things you slap at. And if it goes on out of the way and it don't affect the rest of the church or the position that the preacher's taking, just leave it alone. It ain't worth talking about. It ain't worth fooling with. We, we make Goliaths out of lines sometimes. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. I'm telling you, we make lions out of lions and bears. I'm not telling you that we don't need to kill some lions. Brother, when the lion rises up, it's time to take his head off. It's time to rend him. It's time to get nasty with him in the bullpen and tell it like it is. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I want to tell you something, though, also. David was the kind of man that did not replicate his victories. He killed one lion. And he went on and killed a bear. And then he went on and killed Goliath. He went from one victory to the next victory. Praise the Lord. Our problem sometimes is, brethren, that we have a victory and then we want to park around that victory. So hallelujah. We want to try to go back and replicate that victory and do it all over again. Praise the Lord. Let's move on.
more some more things. Amen. Yeah, but the Gilbert, when he ascended the throne, he said, there's something I want to do. There's something that's in my heart. I've killed the lion, and I've killed the bear, and I've killed the giant, and I've come back from the bow, and everybody's been shouting, saying, Amen. Yeah, Saul has slain us thousands, but David has slain us ten thousands. What do I do now? Amen. Yeah, he said, I'll tell you what I want to do. I want to better the spiritual condition of Israel. I'm going out and getting the ark, and I'm going to bring the ark home. I'm going to bring that ark home. I'm going to bring the glory back to where it really belongs. Oh, hallelujah. There must be present equal attention given to the spiritual welfare of the apostolic movement. Hallelujah. 
Amen. Those might be flip lamp arrested fellas. Hallelujah. Sitting around need to hear somebody preach about the man of sorrows. Oh, hallelujah. Come on now. The man of sorrows. Not the sissy of sorrows. Not the wimp of sorrows, but the man of sorrows. Who was acquainted with grief. Oh, hallelujah. Come on now, we need somebody that gets uncomfortable with their namby-pamby lifestyle. We need somebody that hears about a holy God that stirs them and makes them realize that this kind of lifestyle is not what's pleasing in the eyes of the Lord. Amen. Get out of the way. Get out of the way. Get Jesus out of my face. Cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. Quit talking about Jesus and His holiness. It makes me feel too guilty. That's what we need. We still need that convicting preaching that puts us on the altar like we've already heard this week. Come on, I've already wept this week and prayed, Oh, God, wash me one more time and make me clean. I want to be holy, holy like you. Holy Spirit, purify me. Cleanse and make me new. My God! If there's anybody that knows how weak I really am, it's me. I know my weaknesses. Let me move on. I've got to hurry. He said, Wherefore, in verse 12, thus saith the Holy One. <laughs> what day when the Holy One starts talking about this? Because you despise this word. Now, here's the price of rejecting right things. Here's the price of not being in love. With holiness. Oh, hallelujah. Here's the price. It's what it costs you. It's what you pay. But you don't love to have a preacher in the pulpit telling you what it takes to be saved. He said, because you despise this word, and you trust in oppression and perverseness, and you stay their own. Therefore, this iniquity shall be to you as a preach ready to fall. Falling out in a high wall, whose breaking cometh suddenly at an instant. I believe the message here is simply this, that preaching is like a wall. It's like a dam. Amen. That holds a whole lot of things in your life in check. Praise the Lord. It holds a lot of things contained. It keeps it under suggestion that if you don't love preaching, then I'll tell you what starts happening. The wall starts swelling. Let me tell you something. I watch. I watch. And every pastor in this place watches when people turn their ears off to preaching. When they're no longer affected by right things. But they're saying, I'd rather have flattery. I'd rather have smooth things. Come on, don't be so hard, preacher. Please, don't be so tough. Don't be so straight. Don't be so strong with the message. This iniquity, this attitude, this spirit, that wall that's been holding all those things in check, it gets to smell. And I watch you sitting on the streets and And sometimes we think, Sometimes we think as saints. Sometimes people think as saints. Well, what happened? They were doing so good. They were, I tell you, they were in the prayer room. They were shouting on Sunday night. What happened to them? Because they rejected right preaching so long that the thing kept swelling and swelling until there was no more strength left in the wall. And what was behind the wall broke through suddenly. If you don't keep some things contained in your life, if you don't keep some things subjected to the Holy Ghost by preaching, when they're unleashed within your life, they will literally destroy you. Praise the Lord. We'll tell you something. It's not the world that destroys you, and it's not the devil that destroys you. Jesus said, no man can pluck you out of my hand. Amen. It's not the world that comes in and takes you out. It's not the devil that comes in and takes you out. I'll tell you what it is. It's your own flesh. Hallelujah. That preaching has been building a wall for you. And it's been establishing a barrier, a standard. Hallelujah. To hold back some things that if they are not contained, if they're not held in check. When they break forth what appears to be a sudden breaking, which is reality, a 
result of a swelling, a weakening of the wall over a period of time, sometimes a long period of time, it will literally destroy your soul. Your flesh and the works of your flesh are far more dangerous to you than anything else around you. Just give me a few moments. Let me bring this full circle. In the Old Testament, there's some brief mention, some passing mention of what was referred to as the evening wolves. Habakkuk 1 and 8 said their horses also are swifter than the leopards and are more fierce than the evening wolves. Zechariah 3 and 3 said her princes within her are rolling lines. Her judges are evening wolves. They gnaw not the bones till tomorrow. And when you read that, it almost sounds like that they save some things for the next day. But when you study out these evening wolves, they were a type of wolf that moved in in the evening time at dusk and jumped their prey and consumed the prey till there was literally nothing left. Praise the Lord. I'm going to tell you, there's some evening wolves lurking on the peripheral skirts, outer skirts of the church, waiting at a sudden instant when you strayed far enough away from preaching to pounce on you suddenly and consume. I'll tell you something, we're dealing with some. We're dealing with what they call today some social ills or some social issues that are not social issues. In reality, there are spiritual issues. Well, praise the Lord. And if we're not careful, we're going to be sympathetic toward abortion and toward homosexuality because we are constantly being bombarded with the howl of the evening wolves. Oh, hallelujah! And we feel like the best thing to do is just kind of appease them. Somebody that's in the pulpit warning us about the evening walls. Oh, hallelujah. Jeremiah 8 17 said, I'll send serpents and cockatrices among you which will not be charmed. Serpents that will not be charmed. Amen. Hallelujah. We, we got a little flute out. We start playing that little tune and that little serpent starts coming out and we think that we can charm the deadly Carnality. The deadly flesh. Let me tell you something, brethren, saints. There are some things that when they sink their fangs into us, they inject a poison that destroys our relationship with God. There are some things that can't be charmed. We don't need to charm some things in this church. We don't need to think we can play some tunes and we can make them Stay under our spell. Hallelujah. Because he despised his word. Here's what's going to happen. He said the iniquity will be to you as a breach ready to fall and swelling out in a high wall whose breaking forth comes sudden at an instant. And listen. It said he shall break it as the breaking of the potter's vessel that is broken in pieces. He shall not spare so that there shall not be found in the bursting of it a shirt to take fire from her or to take water with all out of the pit. Preaching has not only been designed to save us, but preaching has been designed to keep us saved. He chose by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And it's not just your initial faith in God, it's that keeping right on believing. Every day, coming back to the word of the Lord, coming back to church, saying, preach it one more time, preacher. I believe what you're saying. The devastation that's wreaked upon an individual's life who has risen up and said, don't preach to me right things. It's like the breaking of the potter's vessel. It is rendered so fragmented that it's useless for anything. Nothing large enough to even serve, to take fire, from the hearth or water from the well. There won't be enough left of your walk with God to get fire off the altar of revival. There won't be enough of your walk with God to be able to dip down the wells of salvation and draw water 
Hallelujah. There won't be the joy left. You know what I'm saying? Amen. The price of rejecting right things or the price of rejecting right preaching puts us in a position where we don't have enough left of us to be of any use for the kingdom of God. Praise the Lord. I close with a few words here. The very creation of God, chapter 1 of Genesis, exhibits to us the three agencies that the Lord uses in His work upon earth. His Spirit hovered. His Spirit moved upon the face of the waters. The very first thing that came to this earth was the Spirit of God. And it moved, it hovered over the face of the waters, and it was into the atmosphere of the Spirit that the Word of the Lord went. And when the Word of God went into the atmosphere of the Spirit and said, let there be light, and there was light, there was something created that looked exactly like the Word that was spoken. That's why we need the Holy Ghost in our church services. So when the Word of God is preached, in a congregation, some things happen in us that looks exactly what's being preached right now. Come on, now. if the preacher's preaching on praise, there ought to be some praise rising up in our heart. If he's preaching on Calvary, there ought to be a desire to let the blood flow over me one more time. If he's preaching on holiness, there ought to be an inventory being taken of our heart and not sitting back saying, I don't believe all of that. I don't need all of that. But there ought to be something happening in us that looks exactly if he's preaching on repentance. We ought to be preparing while the Word of God is being preached. Before it was all said and done, God said, Let us make man and give him dominion over the earth. The Spirit moved, the Word produced, and the man preserved what the Word had produced and the Spirit had moved upon. Hallelujah. And in every single major time, in, in the work of God, it was those three agencies that played a very important role. When Israel came out of the land of Egypt, it was the Spirit of God that first came to them in a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. It was the Word of God that was given on Mount Sinai, and it was the ministry that was established in their course of order. They had the Word said about them, I think it's in First or Second Chronicles chapter 15, he said, Now Israel was without a teaching priest, and they were without the law, and they were without a true God. They were without the Spirit, they were without the Word, and they were without the man of God. On the day of Pentecost, the first thing that came to the church was the Spirit. The second thing that came was, this is that, that was spoken by the prophet Joel, the Word of God. The third thing that came was the ministry, when they recognized it and said, men and brethren, what shall we do. Hallelujah. Friend, when you reject the preaching of the Word of God, you have lessened your chances of being saved by 33 and one third percent. When you reject the man of God, you lessen your chances of being saved. Well, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Come on, church. It, it's the truth. Come on, I said it's the truth. There's a lot of folks that are all spirit, but they don't know word and no preacher. And there's some folks that want all word, but I don't want no spirit. Hallelujah. First thing that came, and is, is this Clark right? Am I right? Hallelujah. Yes, it's close. Hallelujah. Close enough. The first thing that came was the spirit. The second thing that came was the word. And I'll be the very first thing that God... Listen to me, church. The very first thing that God does when you sin is He sends His Spirit to convict you. And when you don't respond to His Spirit, He brings the next thing, His Word. I believe, brethren, that there are people in our churches that do things, commit sins, that we don't ever know anything about. Simply because when they committed the act, they repented before the Lord because their spirit was in condemnation and they got it right with God. Praise the Lord. When I was standing in the pulpit and preached, brethren, when I didn't know why I was preaching what I was preaching, and I never did know. And the reason I never did know is because they hit the altar and they got it right with God. They may have rejected the Spirit of God that came first, but when the Word of God came, they responded. Come on now. But I tell you that there have been times that two or three weeks have passed, and I found myself sitting in the altar.
office realizing what I had preached two weeks before. Because they rejected the spirit that came and they rejected the word that came. And the last thing is the preacher. I feel what I'm saying in the Holy Ghost right now. Amen. The last thing that came was the preacher. And I have seen them get up and walk out the door and reject the last opportunity. I'm going to tell you what I believe. I don't believe I hold your salvation in my hand, but I do believe this. That if you reject the Spirit and God brings the Word and you reject the Word and then God puts the man there and you reject the man, you will never go back around the preacher and the Word. Go back to the Spirit. Hallelujah. You're going to come right back through that preacher and you're going to come back through the Word before you ever get back to where you ought to be with the Spirit of God. I have watched people sit on the pew and struggle for months on end until they finally broke down in their spirit and came and said, Pastor, forgive me. I was wrong. I have tried to shout. I've tried to run. I've tried to do these things. I've been unable to make any kind of move toward God simply because I knew that it wasn't right where you were concerned. Oh, hallelujah. I feel a Holy power of God in this place right now. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't want to reject the Spirit of God. I want a, I want a, I want a sensitive heart. I want a sensitive spirit. Oh, hallelujah. Let me tell you something, friend. Amen. You don't know really enough sometime to realize what's happening when God begins to deal with your heart. Amen. David, younger man, transgressed, and the preacher had to come and say, Thou art the man. Hallelujah. But you go down the road when he was an older man, he had learned the lesson. And whenever he had counted the people of Israel, the Bible said that his heart smote him, and he was up all night, and he was waiting the next morning for the preacher when the preacher got there. He didn't have to wait on the preacher to tell him where he was wrong that time. Well, hallelujah. Amen. Jesus looked at those accusers of the woman called the very act of adultery. And he said, woman, or, or, or whenever they brought him and they said, what, would, what, what do you say about it? And he said, he was without sin, cast the first stone. The Bible said, listen, it said they begin to leave from the earnest to the youngest. I'll tell you why the eldest left first. Because they'd been, been down that road. Been there, done that. Hallelujah. And all of a sudden they realized it's time to drop the stones. Because Jesus don't come to church for a stone throwing party. He comes to save souls. Come on, saints. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He comes to deliver. He comes to make a difference in people's lives. Now listen to me. I'm not through yet. I'm, I'm trying. I promise you I'm trying to quit. Amen. The eldest to the youngest because, you see, the younger sometimes are a little more brazen. They haven't learned the lessons that the elders have learned. And as they've already been down the road where they were condemned and convicted and recognized that they had to when they stood before the Lord. When you stood before holiness. When you stood before the epitome of all that's righteous and true and godly and holy, you better drop your box. Put your songs down. Because when you get in His presence, ain't nobody can stand there uncondemned. Come on now. And the elders started leaving and moving out of the way. And it went long before the younger started looking around and they didn't have anybody behind them supporting them. And they said, it's time to throw our rocks down. Let's go. And Jesus looked at this woman. He said, woman, where are the accusers? No man, Lord. Listen. Grace and love said, neither do I condemn thee. But truth said, go thy way. Sin no more. Hallelujah. I'm trying to wrap all this up and just tell you that preaching is so important. And not just any kind of preaching, but right preaching. And straight preaching. And right things 
want a seat. Who wants a preacher to get up and tell them you're okay when you're not okay? Who wants a man of God to get up before a congregation and tell a congregation everything's okay when it's not okay? Who wants to hear flattery when they know that it's not flattery they need? Who wants a Valium tablet when they know they need more than a Valium tablet? They need the radiation of God's Word piercing. Amen. They need the sword that pierces even the divine and asunder soul and spirit. And joins the man that it is a designer of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Who wants smooth things and flattery when they know that it's going to be their shame and their reproach? Hallelujah. We better thank God there's a Holy Spirit, a Holy Ghost that overshadows us. And we better thank our God that there's a Holy Word that goes forth in our midst to try to correct the deficiencies that are in our life. And thank God that there is a preacher that's got the tenacity and the anointing and the desire to preach what's right. And to hold up the Holy One before the church. Hallelujah. Brethren, I have preached my heart today. Thank you for your kind attention. But if we reject right preaching, that which is contained and that which is in subjection to the preaching of the Word of the Lord, if we reject right things, it's going to be a breaking forth. And we are going to be so wiped out, so destroyed. We're going to be so fragmented. How many lives have you seen fragmented because they rejected the word of the Lord? That you will not be any benefit to the church or to the kingdom of God. You won't even be any benefit to your own self. You will not even be able to draw fire for your own self or draw water from the well much less be of benefit to anybody else. I want to fall in love with the Word of the Lord. And I want to fall in love with sin. I want to fall in love with the Holy One. The spell. Let's come to the music, please. I want to fall in love with the Holy One of Israel. I want to fall in love with Jesus one more time. I want to be holy Holy like you. Do you know that portion? Hallelujah. Just sing whatever you feel. Hallelujah. I want to fall in love with right things. Hallelujah. Today that just feels like I need to respond to the Word of God. I don't ever, I guess, as a preacher, brother, as a preacher, I don't want to sit back there, hear another man preach, and reject what he's saying. I want to be open to the Word of God. I want to be receptive to His Spirit. I want my heart to be open to truth. To righteousness, to holiness. How about a church? How about a, all over the auditorium? Is there anybody here this afternoon that feels like it would just be the right thing to do to talk to him for a while?
next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Baptism, then what? Baptism is a burial in water for accountable beings into the remission of sins, for salvation to get into Christ, to become a new creature, to get into the one body. Then, walk in the new life, study and grow, become a servant of righteousness, keep self pure, be an example, have faith in God, follow Jesus, put first things first, Resist temptation, be faithful, and be fruitful.